Um, so I'm Richard Arneson Ugas and we've been looking at the cattle and the grazing at Gambledown Farm. Um, we're a family farm about 270 acres, um, traditionally a mixed farm um, with a couple of employees. Those days are gone um, and it's just myself now with a, a, a bit of part-time help. Um, we've got a pedigree herd of beef shorthorn cattle um, running now um, just over 50 cows and keeping all the young stock um, and uh, keeping heifers and selling pedigree heifers um, as well as animals fat off the farm. We're certified organic with the Soil Association. I've been looking at mob grazing, some people call it management intensive grazing, I think I'd probably go with the latter, um, on the basis that I've not been running the breeding cows and the young stock and the, and the fat stock together, I've been running the, the cows and calves as one group and my young stock and fat stock as a separate group. Um, so it is um, a more intensive form of grazing, certainly in terms of management and in terms of the impact of the animals uh, in the field itself. And uh, I've been experimenting with different crops and different grazing um, techniques to um, manage a, um, the organic status and the fertility of the farm, uh, as well as trying to survive the last two dry summers that we've had. And to that end, I've been growing um, lucerne and, and red clovers and experimenting with herbal lays, which is what we've been looking at uh, this morning with uh, swords with a lot of chicory, plantain, um, deep rooting coxfoot and, and other grasses, quite a complex sort of mix. Um, I've been uh, experimenting sowing these at different times of year. I've come to the conclusion that uh, I'm better off in our dryish part of the world to sow in the autumn. And uh, I've been putting in a, a cover crop as an experiment this year of Westerwold's ryegrass to enable me to use the lays now in the spring. And uh, today is the uh, 13th of March. I turned the young stock we've been looking at out uh, on the 6th of March. Uh, so they've been out a week. I've been out wintering my cows at a separate part of the farm on uh, forage brassicas this winter, which has been quite successful. Um, and my policy has been to uh, follow the forage brassicas with a, an arable silage and a reseed, um, allowing me to introduce these deep rooting species um, to survive the dry weather. These lays respond well to um, short term um, periods of, of exploitation and uh, so we've been looking at a system where I've been moving the cattle every day, running them as quite a large group, uh, leaving what appears to be quite a lot of growth and some people might consider it a waste. Um, but I've been moving the animals which gives the grass time to recover and, um, and to, to, to grow again, replenish quite quickly um, and uh, to reduce the impact of the trampling of the animals to, um, to reduce the compaction by moving them quickly. Uh, I'm doing it uh, really for the benefit of the soil. I'm trying to improve the organic matter levels of my soil. I'm trying to improve um, on the back of that all the other advantages of the moisture retention um, to help me survive the, the dry periods. And uh, by having a later growth stage of the, of the grass when I use it, um, although obviously we've been looking at fresh young grass on a new reseed, I'm hoping to improve the animals' diets to get better performance out of them. The animals... Um, yeah, they've been uh, they've adapted quite happily. They they soon learn to to move um, on the daily basis. So they respect the wire and, and happily queue up. They seem contented, um, and uh, the system seems to work well. One's committed to looking after cattle on a daily basis, so it's an extension of the of the daily inspection inspection. But um, yeah, I think it it has its benefits. It's good to be the sort of a the leading edge, I suppose, of. Um, of a sort of a change of management here in the UK. We're learning lessons from across the pond in the States. And uh, it's certainly interesting to be in a small group communicating on the internet and um, at days like this and a chance to sort of drive forward these ideas and make it work better in our environment. It's, uh, it's good to be involved. Uh, I started rotational grazing in 89 and 98 is when I took the holistic resource management course. We took that after we got in financial problems and we were likely going to lose the farm. You can go to some of these holistic management and everybody shares with one another where you go to some of these chemical things and everybody's trying to pick your back pocket and everybody's so willing to share. I was farming and all I was ever worried about was the animals and I never looked at the ground. None of my forefathers ever told me to look at the ground and see what's going on there and it taught me to look at the, the ground and how to um, read what the ground and the animals were telling you and since I've started this uh, 
I've got way more wildlife on my land. I've got, uh, I've cut my uh, mineral consumption by about almost 90% from when I first started. The land is getting healthier with a deeper root system, and the roots are going deeper, and they're storing more carbon in the ground. Uh, we just started measuring it this year. Uh, some of the land that I started with um, is up to 10% organic matter. Uh, they figure in our area it was about 12% uh, when it was first broke up. And we tested one of the places on my farm that I'm just starting to work on, and it's about 3 or 4%. So it's bringing back the land the way that it used to be. I have an alley down the center that's 28 feet wide and I make all my pet temporary paddocks off to the side and I put lifters and I let them in the alley to go to water. Uh, it depends on if you want to tramp more into the ground and feed the soil microbial activity. If you want to do that you make the paddocks long and narrow and if you want to um, you, you bet, get better utilization from the plants you make a square paddock. The animals behave different. The more animals you put in a group the, the different, they graze different when you get higher stock densities. Uh, when I first started, I was using over three acres for an animal for the summer, and now I'm just below one acre for an animal. So my carrying capacity is really uh, improved, and what I'm finding now is my land is healthy. I don't treat the animals hardly at all anymore. They may get a touch of foot rod or a pink eye, and if you don't treat them in the first day or two, they clean up by themselves. Uh, I just, and I haven't seen a cow calve for about uh, seven or eight years now. Uh, they calve out on the grass. My cattle are never in a barn. They're out on the land 365 days a year. This has got to come from the bottom up, and we're not going to be able to, to have scientists. I can't see them ever figuring it out because what I do today, I may change tomorrow. I, I'm completely, all I'm doing is managing chaos. I'm just working with nature and, that, and heading it, trying to head it in the right direction. M mob grazing is something that I've um, looked at when I've um, been in the USA and Canada. And it's a, it's a, si a system of moving cattle um, quite frequently, but getting um, animal interaction with the soil, getting but getting a bit of trampling going, which is helping stimulate the uh, the soil, increasing the soil soil microbial activity, and just basically getting a healthier soil. And a healthier soil, um, while reducing the input costs, can actually um, give us good returns. It takes a bit of getting it takes a bit of getting your head around why you actually increase your stocking density will actually leave you with a more productive um, grass and it's it's something that we, we talk a lot about working with nature and that is definitely working with nature because I would defy any scientist to actually prove that theory a, a group of farmers have sort of realized that we've got to do something different we can't go on the way we've been going on depleting our soils as as mentioned in uh, previous discussions this morning um, this, this, the settlers of the uh, Canadian prairies, prairies have only been doing this for the last say 100 years we've probably had, had a longer spell of um, depleting our soils and so um, our soils are probably in a worse condition and this is this is an opportunity to get our soils back into uh, um, a, d a decent um, level of fertility one of the one of the big issues in is, um, profitability is um, the, the the nutrient availability and the fact that we've got to feed supplement our cattle with uh, more more minerals because we've got a depleted soil and we've got a poor root structure um, and and the animal the the plant can't actually get down to where where some of the nutrients are and um, and obviously likewise with uh, on on healthy food um, we all talk about the organic movement and uh, and other in initiatives and and basically we we look if you have a healthy soil a well managed soil you're going to get more nutritious feed from it and more 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 nu nutritious food for uh, for human consumption also it's we've got we've got a lot of issues at the moment we've got to uh, we've got to 
make, we've got to be more productive because we've got to feed this ever ever increasing uh, population. When I was in China, the seven billionth person was born that day, uh, the day I left, and it's quite an eye opener that in not too many years uh, ahead we're going to be up to sort of around nine billion people on the planet, and we've got to we've got to produce more food, but at the same time we're under a lot of pressure from environmental uh, people to uh, to increase the um, environmental uh, goods from our farm as well. So this, this system, I believe, ticks both boxes. I'm Greg Simons from the United States, from the western United States, where I have operated ranches for the last 40 years. Yes, basically, I mean, the first part of it, it's based on the fact that plants and animals evolve together plants all have evolved with defoliation, whether that's from getting old and senescing, having insects, having uh, large herbivores or small herbivores, rabbits, they've all, and so the, the question or the point has been is how do you balance their use with the right amount of rest so that they can recover from the use? And it's based on, I think, a fairly common sense notion that they probably grew up together, so to speak, and uh, they need each other. What we're doing is uh, trying to use the animals and their impacts, not only in what they eat, but what they're trampling to get, basically, to get the, whatever doesn't go through their belly into the Earth's belly. And, and then we're trying to allow that, uh, that contact to feed the earth, help capture the water by having litter on the ground, and hold the water in by protecting it from the sunlight or protecting it from the wind, and then get the animals to a different place so that this place has plenty of time to rest and digest its meal, so to speak, and recover from that activity. The, maybe you have to contrast what we've currently done uh, in our grazing and what happens with that. And I think one thing you can take a look at, currently what we've done is have a few animals just slightly spread over the ground, thinking that that's gonna be good for the land. But what happens is the plants that are, that are desirable never get a rest from being clipped and reclipped. And if you take a page out of, uh, if you look at Planet Earth series, the one thing that you'll look at in there is you will see things in motion, whether it's a ball of fish, a ball of birds, a huge herd of antelope or, or gazelles or stuff, they're moving. And the fact that they're moving means that they were here and now they're some other place. And so now you get the balance of the use and the churning that gets material into the soil where most of the life on Earth is at, is in the first foot of soil. And then the animals move away so everything can recover and, like I said, digest their meal. Yes, and that's very powerful because there's two things that drive chemical or biological processes on Earth to form carbon, which is where you have carbon formed by life. That is heat from the sun and water. You put those two things together and you have all this activity and so what you're allowing to do when you get the material into the ground, you start increasing the carbon, but but what that really does is increase the ability to hold water through longer periods of time which basically helps the earth because of the water holding capacity of uh, the, the, the heat holding capacity of water it allows things to grow longer and longer because that water is there present not only because there's water there but because there's a moderate temperature there so in those places those areas will be cooler during the summer and warmer during the the fall and spring and so now what that does is is lengthen the green period and why that's important is that now you have things capturing the sunlight for a longer period of time and then the cycle just keeps improving and improving. What we've been able to get away with for 5,000 years is basically um, take advantage of all the natural capital that's been created over 5 billion years of of this water and sunshine coming together producing our coal or oil or whatever our trees 
Malman has kind of been everywhere. We have an expanding population, and we have reduced natural capital, so to speak, soil. And so now we are going to become more and more responsible for not only what we take out, but how much are we putting back in, which at the end of the day is what uh, it will be sensible economically and not only for today, but for the future. And we will get rewarded for it now because its value will be more understandable as the constraints on from population increase uh, and limited resources start showing up.